Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Bella. I'll be your host for today's Mid-Year Economic Outlook. As always, before we hand it off to our presenters, we have a few housekeeping items to take care of. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you on our website under the resources tab and also on our YouTube channel. There is a poll question, or there will be shortly a poll question on your screen as we introduce um, our presenters here. Go ahead and answer that question. Just a brief survey to get your thoughts on kind of our topics today. And then also at the end of the webinar, we'll be doing a Q&A session. So go ahead and feel free to answer or ask any questions that you may have throughout the presentation in the Q&A box below. And we'll get to end as many as we can with the time we have left. So without further ado, Quentin, why don't you start us off with in, by introducing yourself and sharing something that you're looking forward to doing this summer. Good morning. Thank you, Bella. And some of you might be wondering why we're not doing this uh, in person this year. Uh, we've got our front of our lobby still under construction as, or not under renovation as we've been making improvements to uh, the building for almost the last year now. Uh, so hopefully in January when we do our economic outlook for the year uh, that uh, we'll be able to do it in person as well as here in the webinar. Uh, but glad to have you all here joining us. Um, I'm a wealth manager here at KWB, been here for almost eight years. And uh, I'm, this summer I've got three kids and they all, they love to camp. So I'm looking forward to a few more camping trips before the uh, summer is over. How about you, Bob? I'm Bob Bullock, based in Monrovia with KWB. Uh, I've been with KWB since Abraham Lincoln was president. And uh, I'm looking forward to actually teaching my 11 month old standard poodle how to dig in the sand in Carmel Beach later this later uh, this summer. So, hi everyone. I'm Diana Saylor. I'm one of our executive wealth managers, and this is my 23rd year with KWB. And this summer, we are all well, a good majority of us here at KWB are flying to Nashville for a conference, and my husband and kids are going to come pick me up and we're going to drive back across country. So looking forward to that. Nice. I'm Mike Grizuk, one of the executive wealth managers at KWB. Been here since 2007. Uh, actually, this summer, looking forward to maybe taking my daughter and wife up to the mountains and doing something a little bit cooler, <laughs> trying to avoid a little bit of its heat. Mm -hmm. So, well, should we dump, jump in? Yeah, let's do it. You guys ready? Absolutely. All right. So let's begin the discussion by talking about recessions. So I guess the first question is, where is it, <laughs> right? It seems like it's always been six months away, six months away, six months away. And we've been saying that basically since the beginning of 2022. And so I think what's kind of happened here is we've reached kind of an exciting time here with the stock market. You know, come June 8th, we actually entered a new bull market which is you know, basically a 20% increase off of those bottoms. And so I guess the hope is maybe this continues to have momentum, but the stock market's always kind of looking at the economy and trying to predict the state of it, you know, 12 to 15 months into the future. And so when the market was down 25% last year, it was pointed to a recession in 2023. And so it seems like that's getting less of a reality, less of a reality each time that we turn around and the market has been very positive. So Bella, why don't you throw up this chart here, give us a little bit of historic context here. So we reached a high in 2022, basically on January 3rd, and it proceeded to, to the low in October 12th. And then since then, like I said, we've experienced a, a more than 20% rally at this point. And so what's kind of happened is it feels like, really the market's kind of defied gravity here a little bit. But with good reason, I think what, what occurred is analysts were so pessimistic coming into 2023. You know, they thought we were going to have earnings declines. They thought that we were going to have valuations continue to fall off of a cliff. And what's happened is we've actually seen a very resilient consumer and we've seen very, very resilient companies. And so lots of companies have done a very good job of cost cutting, trimming the fat that they had had. And I think, you know, if everybody is thinking there's going to be a recession, there's going to be a recession, and then everybody starts to take steps in order to protect themselves from it, I think you can possibly skirt a recession. And that's what it's looking like may have been occurring here. And so really, I mean, at the start of 2023, let's throw up the, the next chart here, Bella. The fear was company earnings were just going to fall off of a cliff. 
And so we already had depressed valuations when interest rates go up. You know, we think the companies aren't going to be worth as much as they were previously. But then when you combine that with them earning less, it, it is a recipe for a potential new low. And so we saw earnings decline pretty consistently since June of last year. But in March of 2023, it began to turn around. And we've actually seen company earnings stabilize and actually be positive. And so we're in the heart of earnings seasons again right now. We're watching it very closely because I think for the market rally to continue to have steam, we need to have corporate profits actually continue to keep up with it. And so, so far, so good. It looks like things are moving in the right direction, but we're getting earning stability, which I think a lot of people didn't expect. And we're pairing that with a very strong consumer so far. So on a real basis, consumer spending was actually up 3.6% over the last quarter. And that's actually one of the highest readings that we've had, despite inflation at this point. So it's been a very interesting situation and mix between strong consumers, strong companies. And then what, what also tends to be happening is, what do people tend to do when they have jobs? Spend money. Spend. spend. They spend money. And so what has happened with unemployment? Let's take a look at that real quick. So unemployment has actually been at 3.6%, which is very low. You know, if we look prior to the pandemic even, so we all know that the, the real economy looks back to like 2019. I mean, we've had a lot of just, you know, fluff and changes that have happened since the pandemic. But if we look prior to that, we had 3.7% unemployment in, in 2019. So in other words, we actually had lower unemployment through this cycle. And when people are working, they tend to spend. So it's been a, a very tight labor market. The, the Fed has kind of had a tough job because, you know, they're trying to make it so wages don't continue to go up too much. And so when we look at the top light blue line here, we call this the, the job openings or the jolts report is what you might hear it referred to it's starting to come down. And so we want to see job openings going down because it means that the, the likelihood is the Fed is not having to raise more interest rates and potentially push the, the economy into a recession. So usually, historically, when we see a 10% decline in jolts, it's usually accompanied by a 2 to 2.5% 2 increase in, in unemployment rates uh, 12 months into the future. So this is some of the stuff that the Fed is looking at and saying, hey, you know, looks like we might be uh, accomplishing our job here. So, so far, unemployment has been low. We've seen uh, a strong consumer. And so, Diana, what are some of the things that, that uh, you're paying attention to during the cycle with regard to recessions? So there is a tool that is commonly used. It's the leading economic index, and that's put out from the conference board. So Bella, if you'll pull up that chart for me. And so this tool is used to forecast turning points in business cycles and to be basically forecast where the economy is headed. And so we wanted to show you what the, or basically the components of the index. So you can see there the conference board, they have allocated 31% of the index to consumers, 3% to housing, 44% to business and manufacturing, and 22% to financial markets. And what they're basically saying is that if the index declines more than 4% within a six month period, that we will move into a recession. And that is what has happened. And so the conference board is basically anticipating that we will go into a recession either later this year or early next year. But what's interesting with their allocation, the index allocation, is that they have more of a weighting to manufacturing than they do consumers when our economy is close to 70% consumer driven and manufacturing is about 11, 12% of GDP. So we find that pretty interesting. And what we wanted to show you is our, one of our coaching partners, Karsten Wealth, they have their own proprietary index. And what they say is basically, that we should be focusing more so on what the consumer is doing. And so that's why you can see there, their allocation is 50% to consumer, 18 to housing, 23% to business and manufacturing, and 9% to financial markets. And so on one end, you have the conference board saying, basically, it's eminent that we're going to go into a recession. But Carson Wealth 
they're saying that basically the economy is growing a long trend or a little slightly above it. And that's mostly due to the resilient consumer, like you mentioned earlier, Mike. So, you know, it's every day or every other day we hear clients talk about traveling or, you know, friends and family. I think people are finally feeling comfortable traveling more, traveling abroad. They're obviously spending on different things than they were during COVID. So, you know, we start to think about if consumers are really propping up this economy, what might change that? You know, what are some of the things that might derail spending? You know, is it just that they're spending more now because they've done without the last few years? You know, is it wage growth that it's continuing to give them, that's allowing the affordability to spend? You know, there's a variety of different things. We also look at, you know, some, some headwinds, basically. Maybe it's home affordability. Maybe it's the resumption in the student loan payments that are happening later this year. I know on Friday they announced some loan forgiveness, but when you really look at the numbers, it's actually a very small percentage of student loans. So, you know, it's just really evaluating what the consumer is doing and, you know, maybe maybe they'll keep us afloat. I mean, there's some, some interesting statistics when you look at TSA, for example, you know, you mentioned travel and just how many people that we speak to on a daily basis are going out and doing trips. You know, it's You're great. Right. T- TSA, lots of Europe travel. TSA, what had the, the record number of screenings just a couple weeks ago. So, you know, you go to an airport, it is packed. It is full. You try to go to restaurants, they're packed. You know, it doesn't look or feel like you're in a recession. And I guess the best case scenario would be we actually did have a recession last year. You know, nobody ever came out and claimed that we were truly in one, but yet we had lots of signs of one. And so that's typically the best case for the market. But yeah, we look at all these recession indicators like the the conference leading economic indicators, the yield curve, right? The that's, yield curve. that's always been a pretty consistent, you know, indicator of recession. But that's been, you know, shouting recession now for again a, a two year period and yet it still hasn't come. And so some of these indicators, they're probably a little bit broken with the situation that we have today. And so what I look at is what does this all mean for the markets? You know, we could sit here and debate the economy and the state of it forever. The reality is nobody knows. Nobody knows if we're going to be in a recession in the next three months or the next three years. And so we always preach diversification, hold a you know balanced portfolio, don't make extreme moves, whether it's trying to buy or sell, you know, have a reasonable investment strategy. But let's look at some of the historic context. This was actually from LPL's Uh, mid-year outlook that they just produced last week. And lots of interesting historic context. Typically in a year following a year that the market was down, the next year usually averages 15.2%. That's pretty good. You know, I talked about what we called the bullish trifecta in uh, the why it pays to be an optimist talk that Carrie and I had. And as a quick reminder, it's like when you have a Santa Claus rally, you have the first five days of January positive and the whole month of January is actually positive overall. That's the bullish trifecta. But when we have it, usually the market ends 17.4% on a higher uh, annual basis. That's good. Nobody's going to complain about that. And typically the third year of a presidential cycle is the best year for the markets, which we're in, you know, 17% average gain. And here's the big one. So again, we entered a new bull market on June 8th. And usually when that occurs, it's followed by almost a 19% increase. So you have a 20% followed by another 19% increase. So again, the historic returns of the markets with these situations is pretty positive. And so I think that it's a good reason to continue to be optimistic. And what tends to follow a good first half of the year? A good second. And so I think, again, it's good to be balanced, have a decent stock exposure, and to, again, be optimistic. So there are things that we're looking at. There's things that we're concerned about. And I know that, really, I said at this point, it seems like it's unlikely that the Fed is going to be the cause for, for you know, the next recession. And so we're sitting at the possibility of a, maybe another rate hike or so. But we've gone from zero to five and a quarter. I guess the whole naming of this presentation was 
is another quarter or two quarters really going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back? I mean, is that going to be what it takes to cause a recession? And I think the market's already priced that in and thinks, eh, that's what we expect to happen at this point. So I don't personally think that it's the Fed right now that's going to cause the next recession because the market is already looking to that, looking past it, and has anticipated it. So, Quinn, Mike, I mean, what do you Mike, get? I think those, that chart that you just had is amazing because six months earlier, at the beginning of the year, I went to three investment conferences around the U.S., and all the speakers unanimously agreed we were going to have a recession later this year. Right. And so uh, maybe it's the confidence that has come back uh, in addition to the market. Uh, but there's always something to worry about, isn't there? Right. Yeah. And, you know, inflation in June of last year peaked at like, what, 9.1%. Uh, if you had a stack of lumber in your backyard, you were considered you know, uh, to be wealthy, maybe. <laughs> you were if you could that. find the lumber. <laughs> yeah. uh, and now it's at 3%. And it, you know, which is the lowest we've had since then. So things are looking a lot better in like the inflation areas of the economy. Uh, and like you said, Mike, we took it from zero to five and a quarter. So what's likely to like happen from here? You know, yeah, maybe the Fed will raise rates you know, one time that or two, that that's kind of what the market's looking at. Maybe they don't do it at all. But it's never and it's never happened after the Fed has paused historically. Right. So it doesn't mean, you know, it can't happen again this time, but it's never occurred in the past. Yeah. And so, you know, one question we get a lot is like, are we going to have deflation? So deflation is the actual like lowering of prices versus disinflation, where it's just, hey, things are going up, prices are going up, they're just not going up quite as fast as they were before. Where might we have deflation? Could maybe be in like the used car area where we've seen it a little bit, maybe even in new cars, just as you know, producers get better at making their vehicles, materials um, become easier to find, technology improves. Uh, one of the things, you know, just the other yesterday, I believe, uh, one of the auto manufacturers had a, a pretty significant hit to its stock price because it got more efficient. It got more, you know, now it can reduce the price of its vehicles. And apparently that was a bad thing. But, you know, it's that's one of the areas where, yeah, we could maybe see deflation. Uh, what we're more likely to see is disinflation. So, Bella, if you can throw up that disinflation chart. What this is kind of telling us is, hey, CPI, which is the white line on the on the chart there, you know, inflation is going down and it's gone down pretty significantly. But consumer expectations haven't gone up quite as rapidly, maybe as inflation has gone down. And what's consumer expectations? It's like, how do we feel about the labor market? How do we feel about the stock market, the economy as a whole? And most people feel a little bit better about it because inflation has gone down, but things are still expensive and they're not maybe as overly optimistic yet because we're still talking about um, a recession. You know, that's like one of the biggest items in the expectations category that uh, is actually holding back the growth here in kind of our consumer confidence is this concern about uh, a recession. Now, where things have gotten better is wages. So Bella, if you can throw up the next chart, this is what real wages has have finally gone positive. Okay, They've, we've had a 4.3% growth in, in wages and now inflation is at 3%, which means we people have money to spend. They are feeling better um, because now their wages are in the positive territory where, versus before they were kind of in a negative, couldn't, weren't keeping up with inflation or surpassing it. Where is this happening the most though? It's like in an age group of around thir age 35 and those making about $35,000 a year on average. And so why is it there? It's because, you know, that's where we saw the most wage increases. If you drive around, you know, you know, McDonald's, Home Depot, Lowe's, they're all hiring people. They need, they still have signs out there and the wages are uh, higher than they were, significantly higher than where they were um, before because they're trying to get people to come work for them. So well, that, that tends to be the area too that really they tend to spend the most. Yeah. You know, so you reach right. a certain income level 
and you give people more money and they'll just save it more. So that doesn't help the economy. So yeah, having higher wage growth in that particular category is typically good for the economy. They tend to spend it. Mm-hmm. But aren't wages uh, inflationary? Yeah, but, definitely. Because like nobody's going to want to, I won't take a pay decrease, but sure, I'll take a pay increase. Nobody wants to have their pay cut. Right. Well, I think, you know, what's kind of happening though, Bob, is it's like the the rate of, let's call it the vol- velocity, velocity of jobs, you know, the, the rate of people changing has really fallen off a cliff, you know, and that's part of that Jolts report that I had talked about where openings are closing. And so you just don't have that opportunity to go and get poached by a different company and get a 30, 40% wage increase. So it's, it can be inflationary, but I guess it's just not happening like it was in 2021 that where, you know, you just had this, this massive spike in it. Yeah. And, and technology is improving. Like I said, with the auto manufacturers, like you, you know, electric cars are actually more efficient to be produced just because they can do it with more automation than they can with the general combustion engine. Um, and it's likely to reduce costs. It's actually funny. I was reading a book to my kids last night. It was a Curious George book. And they had the guy up there moving the at the train station, moving the letters around, <laughs> reorganizing where the train was. You know, And they like paid somebody to go up there and do that. And now it's just a computer driven uh, system. You know, and and airlines too. Bob, you were talking about what was happening there with Delta and we saw um, Delta and United pilots. Uh, and this is probably a, a function of three and a half percent unemployment rate. Uh, the pilots union have uh, agreed on both of those airlines over the next three years for a 40 and a 41 percent increase in wages. That's wow. inflationary. But they need them just to stop the cancellations that they've had, right. that they've had in flights, right? right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there's no, ro- to... no robots in the cockpit at this point. They yeah. Do. Yeah, they've done studies that show that, yeah, if, you, if there's a, a no, if there's no person, human in the cockpit, people are not likely to get on that airplane. And uh, and with all of us demanding travel and uh, that it's gotten more expensive, you know, they got to keep the pilots and um, to fly the plane so we don't have the cancellations. And they're also having to spend more money on training because they don't have the the system for bringing people up that they that we used to through maybe military or other areas so they're actually having to spend money to help get pilots through school so if you're looking or know anyone who wants to become a pilot it's actually not a bad time uh to get into that space because of you know you're gonna get your education kind of you know paid for um and, and help in that in that way so what do you think, Bob? What are we thinking the Fed's signaling? Are you feeling good about a you know one or no rate increases coming up here? Well, Mike can probably speak better than I can, but the, at least the market's expecting one or two rate increases. Um, and uh, that that would probably be, uh, that would satisfy the market. And we'd probably have a nice rally if, if that's all the Fed does. My worry is uh, what happens if inflation is a little bit higher than what the market is expecting? Uh, I don't like to see 40% increase in in pilot wages. That's very inflationary. Um, it's always the unknown that that worries me, and uh, it looks good at the moment. Um, but uh, we'll see what happens over the next six months. I think uh, the the big question is just: Is the Fed actually going to raise interest rates? You know, again, they've historically never done it after a pause, or are they posturing? You know, are they trying to keep people a little bit on edge? You know, trying to keep corporate spending down and, you know, control inflation just kind of out of that fear that, oh, you know, if things get too good, they could raise rates. I mean, the the reality is the market is still like if you look at the bond market, they're pricing in rate cuts in 2024. So it'll be interesting to see who's right. You know, mm-hmm. the posturing of the Fed chiefs or the actual market. And historically, the market tends to do a better job of predicting the the months ahead. Yeah. And we still don't know the effects of the interest rates being this high as well, right? It takes 12 to 18 months to really see the effects of interest rates as high as they are. So we've seen some of the effects on some of the banks. Obviously, the banks have tightened up. Right. And uh, we've seen some of the banks go away. Uh, but yeah. that's one of the uh, the downsides So much higher interest rates in addition to what we've seen some effects on real estate. Yeah. And so if the Fed pauses, though, you know, 
this could be a good thing for some of the undervalued areas of the market because you know up and it's changed a little bit since we started talking about this and getting ready to kind of bring this presentation to you guys but uh you know, the undervalued areas could actually pick up and it has been happening. But Mike, what it like when we talk about market breadth, you know, what was happening before that has kind of softened a little bit here? So market breadth is basically how many companies are going up versus going down. And so what was occurring at the beginning of the year was it was so concentrated. You know, you saw these mega cap companies, you know, think your Apples, Amazons, Googles, Teslas, things like that, doing phenomenal. And yet the rest of the market was doing almost nothing or was actually still going down and making new lows. And so at one point it was like half the market was higher, half the companies were higher, half the companies were lower. And we started to see these, these big players emerge as just being substantial winners. And so we we don't necessarily like that kind of concentration. You know, the, the markets get a little bit nervous because, Bella, why don't you throw up my chart? Let's let's take a look at some of these returns that these companies have done. You know, so Apple up 45%, Microsoft almost up 40%, NVIDIA. NVIDIA at one point was basically making up 82% of the return of the S&P 500. And so that that's a lot of concentration. Up 190%, but you know, in one quarter, they basically said we we're increasing our earnings by 19 times. Yeah, in a quarter, not a year. So they have definitely been the biggest winner of this AI phenomenon that, that's kind of captured the attention of the market. And so what's kind of interesting is when you look at these names, the, the top winners this year pulling up the index are those tech companies. But if we looked at last year, the same chart was true, except in reverse. You know, the companies like our uh, healthcare, our financials, our energy companies, they were the ones that felt like they were keeping the market from falling off of a cliff. And our tech, our growth style companies were the ones that were having really, really big repricing. So, you know, I think I kind of joke with people. I say, if you don't like your investment strategy, wait a year, you know, and the reality is like since 2020, we've seen just this big sector rotation between growth companies, your your tech NASDAQ style versus more of your Dow player as to who the, the winner is. So 2020 growth completely outperformed, 2021 value outperformed through 2022 even. And now this year it's flip-flopped again and growth is doing extremely well. So the big fear has just always been if these five companies that are really outperforming, if they all of a sudden you know, stop doing as well, they have a bad earnings report, is that going to cause the market to crash back down? And historically, the reality is, usually we, we have outperformance by just five companies. So this isn't, this isn't out of the norm, actually. This is very common for the stock market to have concentrated growth. And usually when it's within just a five company uh, spread here that we see, when we look forward 12 months, usually the market's 22.2% higher on average. So Mike, again, uh, Mike, I've got a question for you. Do we see concentration at the beginning of a bull market or yeah. for the end of it? No, you typically will see it at the beginning of it, you know? So it's like you get a couple of key players that, you know, begin to get earnings in the right direction or they're the ones that really have cut expenses. And so it starts to create excitement and it trickles down versus the opposite. So it's, fine to see concentration. It usually is led by other companies being dragged up. And so one of the things that I look at, Bob, is what we call the advanced decline index. And so Bella, why don't you toss up my chart here that kind of shows this. And basically the exciting news is this has reached a new high. So think about it this way. The advanced de decline line here that we're seeing is basically the cumulative daily tally of all stocks going up versus down. And so when it's making new highs, it says, hey, the, the higher concentration of stocks are actually going up. And so that's a positive trend. And so we began the year with very, very, very concentrated growth, but it's starting to spread. You know, we're seeing other companies begin to make new highs. And case in point, do you, do you know what the best performing companies were in, in the month of June? Utilities. 
It was actually uh, the the uh, yeah, I mean utilities have done well, but it was actually the cruises. Oh. So like Royal Caribbean Carnival. I mean, they had these phenomenal months, and so even though we were still riding this excitement of AI, the the growth is spreading to these other areas. And we're starting to see other companies begin to do well in, in addition to just tech. And that's what we want to see. We want to see market breadth get better. And what I've always learned is that breadth leads price. And so what I mean is when you look at major market peaks, we tend to see less stocks making new highs. And so we, we want to see a bigger concentration of companies doing better. So breath is usually weakening at the peak of a market. But today what's happening is we're having breath make new highs. And yet we haven't caught up to the price levels that we saw at the beginning of January. So usually as breath is widening, it's followed by new highs and higher prices. And so I think that that's one of the things that I'm excited about is watching this breath get better knowing that typically it's followed by higher prices. And something that might contribute to that, Mike, is you think of all the people that have been on the sidelines this whole time. You know, as they enter in, maybe they're going to purchase smaller mid caps because maybe they're undervalued. They've been hurt this year, I think, with the anticipation of a recession. So that definitely would help with breadth. Right. Well, and what's kind of happened is this has been the most hated rally. You know, like Bob had mentioned, you know, you you went to that seminar and you had all these negative economists, but that negativity is carried throughout the year. And I almost feel like they're they've been on the sidelines, sitting in cash, thinking that there was going to be this this you know new earnings cliff and this dive down to new lows potentially. So they were very light on stock exposure, and so they've missed this pretty significant rally, uh, being overly conservative, and so. What do you do when you miss a big rally and it looks like it has legs? You tend to play catch up. So you start pouring money into the things that haven't recovered as much, thinking that they're going to play catch up to those mega caps that have done extremely well. And yeah, again, it increases breadth and it causes more companies to, to begin to, to move higher. So definitely we're seeing that with mid and small caps. And we're going to continue to likely see that with places that haven't done as extremely well as those mega cap companies. Yeah, and a lot of, it's like, if not now, when? If I don't do it now, when am I gonna do it? And I, that's why I a lot of people are jumping in and what kind of what's happening. I think too, the other thing is like, hey, you know, the uh, if you sell something, I think we forget about the fact that if we sell a stock, uh, somebody's buying it on the other side of things. You know, it's not like you just go sell and you get your money and you walk away. Somebody's purchasing it. Now they might not purchase it at a lower or they might purchase it at a lower price. But then a lot of people too don't just take their money and like just go put it in cash. They might move it to those undervalued areas as well. So they're shifting, you know, where they've put their assets and and over time. And that's also going to help um, kind of spread out this breadth a little bit, widen it. But that's why we like recessions. Because we get to buy everything, including stocks at 20 to 30% off when we have one. But yeah. um, that consumer keeps spending and they keep traveling. And so uh, maybe because they can't afford real estate. What's, what's the same when you're living through the recession? It always feels like the end of the world. But in hindsight, it always looks like the best opportunity. Right. And so I guess we try to be a little bit ahead of that curve and look towards the opportunity when we feel the worst. And that's what we should be doing as investors. Yeah. So what's the opportunity in real estate? Yes, real estate. So I think for years, we've all been wondering when are prices finally gonna, <laughs> gonna capitulate? I mean, it's just been years. And so, you know, really last year when the Fed started raising rates, I think that everyone thought that was going to be the catalyst to bring prices down. And so, Really, we haven't seen much of that as far as price decline. So what we have seen, though, is sellers are backing out. You know, as of June last year, we've seen listings, new listings drop about 24 percent, 17 percent less homes uh, are sold from June of last year. And we're at the lowest level of home sales ever. But that's more of a supply issue. You know, we have a supply shortage. And so. 
right now, as far as, as rates, Bella, if you'd ring, bring up the mortgage rates, you can see what has happened here to mortgage rates. Obviously, they are increasing as the Fed raised rates, but they aren't solely based on what the Fed funds rate is. And so you can see at the end of last year, it peaked a little over 7%. And right now, the national average for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage is probably about 7%, maybe a little over, just depends on the, on the type of loan. But really what's happening is that sellers have backed out because maybe they don't want to sell their home with the 2 to 4% fixed rate mortgage that they currently have to go get another mortgage that's 6 or 7%. So you have a lot of people that have backed off. Um, but at some point, they will come back. You know, it's just a matter of time. And what we have seen is that from June of last year, prices actually are flat from last year. The national sale price or the median sale price nationally is 426000 And so it's basically flat. We haven't really seen much of a decline. And but what's interesting, though, is what's still happening is homes are being sold over asking. So about 40 percent of homes are sold above list price. It is still down from last year. So what we are seeing is people are paying more. They're buying over asking, but maybe not the craziness that we saw in 2021 where people were offering 10, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 over asking. I don't think we're seeing that much these days. Uh, but it is still competitive and it is still a seller's market. Some positive things that we're seeing is that single family housing starts are actually at 11 month high. I think coming into last year, home builders were very negative along with most others. And so as you know, re recession e fears ease, basically, maybe they're becoming more confident. And so that's a good thing. We need more supply. Uh, Bella, if you'd bring up the uh, home buyer demand, the next chart. So as you can see, the red line, that is home buyer demand. You can see it drastically declining in 2022. And then the orange line is 2023. So you can see it's slowly increasing, but we're up about a 7% from last June. So we are seeing increased demand. And so really what it boils down to is that if you're a seller, and you don't really need to sell your home right now, there really isn't, isn't an incentive if you need to get a new mortgage. You might be you know, thinking, I'm going to just wait and see if mortgage rates are going to come down. I think there's there's conflicting information with analysts. Some think, some think that rates are going to be over 8%. Some think that rates will be maybe five and a half or so by the end of the year, but not coming down much. If you're a buyer, it's kind of an interesting time. I think that if you're ready to go, and you're approved, if you find a house that you really like, it might be in your best interest to move forward with that because if rates start coming down, that's when all of those people that are on the sidelines, they're going to come out and they're gonna start shopping. And so it's an interesting time. I think that with the continued lack of supply and higher demand, prices will probably continue to stabilize. Maybe they'll come down a little bit Rates might start coming down some. I don't know that I see an 8% mortgage rate, possibly, um, but it just looks like things are going to remain about the same. But I'm I'm speaking to single family homes. So, Bob, what are you seeing with multifamily? Uh, it, it's a bit of a different situation, but think about it. Um, home prices, single family home prices have gone up dramatically. Uh, Quinton said earlier that real wages are just turning positive. And so it may be a while that uh, people can afford to buy a single family home. Uh, we're waiting for the wages to continue to go up, much less if interest rates have gone from what, 4% to 7%. It makes buying a home really expensive these days. And so I turn back to the, the multifamily. Um, it takes a while to build an apartment or a townhouse. And so these builders uh, got approvals from their uh, regional and their local community banks for money to build. And so we've seen a dramatic increase in multifamily units being built in the US in order to satisfy that demand. In 2021, 400,000 units across the US were, uh, were built. In 2022, you've got a little bit over 450,000 units. 2023 may be the peak 
of multifamily building in the US. We've got almost 800,000 units, multifamily units coming on board. They probably won't all be finished this year, but it's an interesting situation in that you've got a peak of supply. My suspicion is uh, rental prices will probably drop some just because of the massive supply that's coming on board at about the time that the economy may be slowing. I mean, we, we, we were worried regarding a recession. And so uh, I doubt that the rents are gonna be enough for some of these builders to, to make the mortgage payments about the time that they may need to finance, refinance uh, these commercial mortgages, which is about every three to five years. And about the time, frankly, uh, we've seen commercial real estate banks tighten up on their mortgage lending standards. Uh, especially after the three banks that we saw go under at the beginning of this year. And so we may see a repricing of some of these multifamily units and commercial real estate properties, which means prices may go down. Uh, that's one of the concerns that I've got uh, as to what could cause maybe the, the next recession. But we got tons of supply, maybe the peak of supply, and uh, we may be, be seeing a, a tightening of standards and, and uh, some difficulty on the commercial real estate side. Well, and that the increase in supply, the possibility of rents declining, I mean, that's that's been one of the biggest components of inflation. You know, we had 18% increase basically in rent in 2022, followed by basically zero. And so we keep seeing these positive inflation prints, you know, the last several readings. And the biggest component of those inflation prints on CPI is basically housing. And so when you have zero print, it means so that we have a roadmap to the Fed to be able to uh, say mission accomplished and soft landing, and maybe we don't need more rate hikes. So, I mean, it it is definitely going to be uh, something that we have to watch closely, and we don't necessarily know how the commercial real estate thing is going to unfold, but hopefully the Fed does have that roadmap to be able to stop the tightening and maybe even lower rates, which would you know, definitely help with uh, the commercial real estate issue. It might. It's. We'll see what happens, as I said, over the next uh, six months to a year, especially on the commercial real estate side. So there's always something to worry about, isn't there? <laughs> and this is what makes the Fed's job so difficult. You've got uh, maybe a decrease in, ho in housing prices and a decrease in rents, which is, and we know technology is very deflationary. Well, the other side, we see a massive increase maybe in some wages, especially if you've got some talent like airline pilots, 40% increase over three years. That's what makes the Fed's job so difficult. So is it better, better to buy or rent, huh? Well, yeah, we've got a slide that sort of highlights that. Uh, Bella, if you'll bring that up. As I said, um, we've seen a dramatic increase in interest rates when it comes to mortgages. And that blue line indicates the medium price for a monthly home payment which is just under $2,500. You contrast that with maybe a softening of rental uh, price and the average rent across the US is just under 1,800. Uh, and so higher interest rates continue to make renting very economical these days. And I, I've got a second slide that sort of highlights my concern when it comes to commercial real estate. Um, the banks really allowed a lot of uh, borrowing for the commercial real estate uh, uh, development in 2022, uh, after the three banks that we saw uh, go under, uh, and with the higher interest rates and the risk of a recession, banks beginning this year really began to uh, heighten their standards. And so they dramatically decreased the lending. And so imagine if you're in commercial real estate or a multifamily developer needing to refinance your mortgage at much higher interest rates with a lot less potential rent that's coming in. Uh, those values on that commercial real estate is going to have to be repriced. We may see some decrease in, in values, but the banks are well prepared. I saw a, a chart uh, indicating that the average loan to value, which was around 70%, uh, is now down to about 60%. So we could see a 30% decrease in commercial real estate values, and the banks are well prepared for that. Uh, they won't suffer any losses. And so... Uh, uh, most re uh, recessions in the U.S. are caused by real estate, which is probably our highest leverage asset that we all have. Uh, but the banks are in good shape for that. And uh, my fear, once again, is, as Mike says, the market looks good. The market's anticipating only two rate increases. 
but it's always something that comes up that that causes the next recession that we don't know about. And so yeah. we may not be in, uh, we might be with a recession anytime soon, but at some point, we, and we all know this, we'll have another recession. Right. But we're not thinking anytime soon, you know, with low unemployment and consumer spending. And so just to summarize, we wanted to let everyone know, we talked about a lot today. So we just mentioned the likelihood of recession low in the near future. Inflation is trending downward. The Fed may raise rates one to two more times. As Mike said, you know, we might get that soft landing after all. And if we do go into a recession, it's probably not the Fed that will cause it. It would be something maybe unknown or something we're not anticipating. We do anticipate uh, the possibility of the stock market to continue to rise with more breadth, as we discussed. Housing prices may come down some, but it should remain stable due to lack of supply and increase in demand. And mortgage, rate, mortgage rates may come down slightly, but probably not much. And the multifamily housing trend should continue, but possible concerns around lending from regional banks. So just a summary for you. And with that, if Quentin, I think you were going to take questions. Yeah, so Bella, why don't you throw up the uh, poll question that we did here at the beginning? And while we get to that, if you got, there's a couple questions in the queue here, but if you have one, you can throw it in the, the Q and A uh, box down there at the on the bottom of your screen. So here, our poll was in the next six months, I think the economy will be better, get worse, or stay the same. And it looks about, you know, the majority of us feel that it'll either stay the same or be a bit better uh, rather than getting worse. And that's probably where we fall, um, at least for the next six months as well. Uh, the first question we've got here is, how are all the strikes in various fields impacting the economy slash market? Uh, one area, I, Bob, you kind of, when you brought up the airlines, you know, one of the reasons I believe that they did, they did what they did was to prevent a strike because they didn't want, you know, if pilots went out and not went on strike, then we would have more delays and other issues in, in flight or, you know, in air travel. Um, so I would say that like, you know, that's what the result is, is longer term, like, hey, we're going to have wage increases, which probably could impact inflation, right, Bob? Yeah, I mean, when you when you uh, when a company, uh, whether it's an airline or whether it's a restaurant, um, has a price increase, especially when it comes to wages, somebody's got to pay for that, right? And they usually right. have the consumer pay for that. And so whenever any increase in expense goes up, including strikes with an increase in uh, in wages, that's inflationary. Um, and so that's 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 one of the concerns that I've got with the Fed. Yeah, and most of these strikes, whether it's you know U UPS, teachers, uh, the rider strike, green riders, yeah, the yeah, they're actors. all you. It's all usually over some form of compensation, uh, which is you know if we raise uh, wages, I mean that's going to have a longer longer term sustained impact on higher prices. I think too one of the other components of it is what what do companies and businesses tend to do as costs increase? They look for ways to mitigate those costs. Right. And typically, I think Quentin had alluded to it that technology tends to be one of the biggest deflationary components of the market, and so it'll be interesting to be basically be able to see where is this development in AI going to be able to take us? You know, are more companies going to be able to cut labor? And labor tends to make up 70% of, of costs for companies. And I think we've seen that in, in the restaurant businesses. You know, you have a lot less staff these days. You don't have as many people taking orders. You got kiosks. And so there's a lot of replacement when the labor component becomes too expensive. So I think Lots of times we'll see increased costs followed by changes in technology, which help try to mitigate those costs, but they come at the cost of jobs as well. Yeah, and that'll lead that leads to a shift too, as we've always kind of seen. Jobs might be lo lost in one area, created in another. Right. Uh, next question here we've got is most car prices are still several thousand above MSRP. Will this trend continue? 
Uh, one thing that, about cars is, and I kind of found this interesting, was that out of the pandemic, uh, the, the Asian car manufacturers so like Toyota and Kia, Hyundai, they actually didn't manage their inventory as well as they could have, which is why if you drove by a Toyota lot, you saw like nothing in their parking lot. And like you went over and you maybe saw Ford or GM and like they had cars in their parking lot or in their their lots, uh, which was kind of a shock to me. I thought maybe these guys would do it better than the American car manufacturers, uh, but that didn't seem to be the case. So that's what kind of led kept prices high. There was a lot of demand. If you wanted the car, you paid the price uh, that the dealer was you know listing it at. But actually today, you know, one of the better deals in the market, we are actually seeing discounts in the uh, American car manufacturers. So if you drive around town, you'll see more, you know, incentives there uh, than you will on the other manufacturers. Um, but so it'll probably change as everyone's kind of bought their car. You know, people will probably, you know, stop buying. Uh and then as technology too improves, like I said, the, some of them are improving their manufacturing and getting their materials for their electric cars, bringing down their prices. Uh, and so as that kind of improves and gets changes and maybe new technology, that'll help the car prices as well. But used cars definitely came down. Yeah, dramatically. Yeah. 10% <laughs> so far, so. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Mike's probably in the market for a car in the next year or two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we don't have any more uh, questions here. Um, so anything else, Bella, before we close up for the day? And a few final things here. Once again, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you all joining us. You'll be hearing from us once this recording is uploaded on our website and to you, the YouTube channel. And you'll also be receiving an email from us shortly after this ends with a survey asking for your feedback. These webinars are for you and we wanna make sure we talk about things that are relevant to you. So we'd really appreciate your feedback on that. If we didn't answer any of your questions today or there's something you wanna ask more specific to your situation, please go ahead and send an email to invest at kwbwealth.com and we'll make sure to get back to you there. Stay tuned for our next webinar. We'll be hearing from Carrie and Bob as they share some wisdom with us on Wednesday, September 20th. Thanks for joining. Have a wonderful day.